I can get, I just started. I didn't record that other stuff. It wasn't that important. Okay. But if we look at the eukaryotic infectious agents, right, we're going to be focusing in on those organisms that have a nucleus, right? We're going to be looking a lot about bacteria in this course and in this lab. But um, today in lab, because, because of the challenges we're facing, we've moved the eukaryotic organisms up, right? And so therefore, it's really important for us to understand that eukaryotic infectious agents have a nucleus, they have membrane bounded organelles. And we're gonna be looking at lots of different organisms. We're gonna be looking at organisms that are single celled, and we're gonna be looking at organisms that are multicellular, right? So this is a ciliate, this is a flagellate, right? And this is an amoeba, single celled. This is a tapeworm, and that's a bed bug, right? Those are multicellular. Okay, so some of the things we've already looked at are yeast. How do we know these are yeast? Somebody tell me, how do we know that these are yeast? Budding, mm -hmm. very good, good. So this is a review from last time. You should have picked that up that these are yeast because of budding. And then we talked about the molds, right? And so we talked about several components of the molds that we use to identify them, spores and mycelia, right? And here's bread mold and the and the fuzziness on there is the mycelia, right? And so the mycelia is this elongated structure here, right? If they have cross walls in the mycelia, what type of mycelia are they? Mm -hmm. What type of mycelia have cross walls? Septate, very good. And then from here, they give rise to these little structures that look like fingers. And these little structures that look like fingers start with a P. What is they called? Phyllites, very good. And then from the phyllites, you see the spores, right? What is an individual segment in the mycelia called? Starts with an H. Hyphae. Very good. So that's to review. We've already done that, right? But now I want to talk about the things that we're going to talk about today and in the future. Right? So we're going to talk about the single cell protozoans, and I'm going to show you those in a minute. We're going to talk about multicellular organisms, and those are going to be more fascinating to people because you can see them with your naked eye. You don't have to look under a microscope. We're going to talk about the trematoda, which are the flukes. We're going to talk about the cestoda, right, which are the tapeworms. And we're going to talk about the nematoda, which are the only true worms, right? And so here you can see that in this person's in small intestines, you can see that there are maybe thousands of roundworms in them, right? And so that's causing, yeah, that's causing an impaction. It's causing all kinds of medical problems for this person, right? Good. We're also going to look at some of the exoparasites, right? And so we're gonna look at the insects. Does anybody, I'll call it, this, is a, this is a body louse. This is a crab louse, that's a flea, that's a bed bug. How do we know that these are all insects? What do we use to, real quickly, to determine if they are insects? What do we use? Anybody know? You're gonna learn something new today. David, what say you? Cesar, we haven't picked on the new guy for a while. Eric. Yeah, sorry, sorry. What, what, what do, how do we know these are insects? What do you mean, six legs? Six legs. That's correct. Count them. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. Four, five, six. Okay, six eggs, insects, and then we're gonna look at the arachnida. Now this this is a mite, right? This is a mite, right here. This is also a mite. 
but we call it a chigger. How many people have ever had chiggers? <laughs> Oops. Yeah, not good. Right. And of course, this is our friend, the tick. Now these are important parasites, but, but the tick and the mite can also be vectors, right? So somebody remind me why we are interested in the insects and the arachnids because they're vectors. Somebody remind me what a vector is. What's a vector? Somebody remind me what a vector is. What's a vector? Jenna, you haven't spoken up yet today in lab. What's a vector? I'm going to be honest, I don't really remember. That's okay, that's okay. I have no problem with that. A vector is an organism that can transmit an infectious... No, <laughs> no, Cesar, we're not doing math. But a vector is an, is an organism that can transmit an infectious agent from one organism to another, from a dog to a human, from a human to a human, okay? Why are these arachnida? Sasad, give it a shot. Why are these arachnida? Anybody know? That's right, they have eight legs, right? Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, they're related to spiders. They're very related to spiders, right? So again, you can count these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ooh, it's almost time for chigger season too. And um, by the way, if you don't like chiggers, come this spring, stay out of the Bermuda grass. They love Bermuda grass. So now you can see an overview of the different types of parasites that we're going to be talking about. Some of them, because they truly are parasites, but others, even though they are parasites, but they can also be vectors, right? And so they're important that way. Anybody have any questions? Okay. So. Let's look at the protozoal parasites. Protozoal parasites are single-celled parasites, right? And so if we think about these, the two most important stages of development that you guys are going to need to know for me are the cyst and the trophozoite. of the protozoal parasites. Now, I'm simplifying it, right? There, in some cases, there are a lot of stages of development, but we're just gonna talk about the cyst and the trophozoite. The cyst is protective, right? It's protective. And it is how they get into our body. Okay, the trophozoite is active. It is free swimming in most cases. and it causes the infection. Okay, so many of, many of the parasites that we're gonna be talking about are gonna cause dysentery because they're, they're going to be infecting the GI tract, okay? Not all of them. And surely, I mean, I've selected just a few of them to talk about in lab, but not all of them cause GI problems. But the ones that we're going to be talking about, there will be a few that will cause infections of blood, but you'll be able to see the blood cells, right? But if you see debris in the background, that's going to be a fecal smear and it's going to be 
causing dysentery. Okay, anybody have any questions so far? So if we think about this, most of these infections are going to be through the fecal oral route, right? And what that means is that the organisms are gonna be picked up from somebody's contaminated hands or some other contaminated uh, fomite, inanimate object. And then you're gonna get it into your mouth, right? But remember, the most important things we're gonna look at, and you're gonna be responsible for on the practical, are the cysts, the trophozoite, and what type of infection it causes. Here you can see that the cyst gets into the body, and in some cases, it, it's, it has to get through the stomach acid so that the stomach acid weakens it, and then it breaks apart. And then it becomes a trophozoite, and it causes the infection, and some of the trophozoites will then become a cyst, and the cyst will then be released to the outside of the body. In, cyst in, and cyst out. And therefore, the life cycle continues, okay? Here is a simplified version of that happens, right? So the cyst is environmentally resistant, right? It's protective. It transmits the infectious agent. So here's the cyst going through the mouth, then into the stomach. The stomach weakens it. So you see it's got four nuclei in it. Each of those nuclei will break apart and become a trophozoite. The trophozoite then causes an infection in the small intestines and the large intestines. And then they come out, right? The trophozoite, remember, is the active, the modal, the free swimming, the one that causes the infection. But the trophozoite is very fragile in the environment, right? It, it can only truly cause problems if it's in your body. If it gets released to the outside of the body, it's not a problem typically, okay? All right, now, Let's talk about the organisms that we're gonna be looking at, right? We're gonna be looking at the archaeozoa. And so these organisms move by flagella, but they're a transitional group from the bacteria. They're called archaeozoa because they're ancient. And even though they move by flagella and they have a nucleus, they do not have mitochondria. So their electron transport system is in their plasma membrane, just like the bacteria, right? The euglenozoa are more advanced. They move by flagella, but they have mitochondria. The amoebozoa move by pseudopoda, right? And so these little protrusions are pseudopods, and that's how they move. The cellophora move by cilia, right? And so you can see the cilia all around the cell. And then the apicomyplexa are not modal at all, right? They therefore will have to infect parts of the body that have a fluid matrix, right? The GI tract, the blood, the cerebral spinal fluid, the vitreous humor, the vitreous humor of the um, eyes, okay? Any questions? Here are the organisms that you're gonna be responsible for, right? So under the Archaeozoa trichomonas vaginalis, uh, Giardia lamblia, under Euglenozoa, Trypanosoma gambians, uh, um, Brucey gambians, and Trypanosoma cruci. The Amoebozoa, Amoeba proteus, and Entamoeba histolytica, the Cellophora, Paramecium caudatum, and Balantidium coli, and then the AP complex of the bad boys of the group, Plasmodium, uh, Toxoplasma gondii, and Cryptosporidium parvum. Okay? These are all in that matrix that I showed you last time that you can use to study. Okay? Any questions so far before we start looking at the organisms? Okay. Let's look at Trichomonas vaginalis. Has anybody ever heard of it? Has anybody ever heard of Trichomonas vaginalis? It's a, it is a sexually transmitted infection, right? Yes, you can get it from fomites. But 
mostly it's sexually transmitted. There are people doing research on this that will tell you that it is the most important sexually transmitted infection that there is. I disagree with that. So I think it's chlamydia followed by gonorrhea, then trichomonas, right? And if you want to throw in HPV, you could do that also, right? But it can be tragic because 50% of the cases of individuals who pick up trichomonas are asymptomatic. And the really interesting thing about this organism is because it doesn't really, uh, uh, it doesn't really come in contact with any very harsh environments like the GI tract. It doesn't really need a cyst. So it's important to recognize the trichomonas vaginalis goes from one really, really hospitable place, the penis, to another really hospitable place, the vagina. And therefore, it only has a trophozoitic state, not a cyst state. The trophozoite, I tried to color code these. The trophozoite, you can see, it's being pointed to by these purple arrows. And to me, it looks like a mouse, click, click, like the mouse I am using to move my cursor around, right? Like that mouse, okay? And so it has this pointy edge, it's called an axle style. And that's the way it attaches to the tissues of the parts of the body it's infecting, right? So it causes a sexually transmitted infection. The infection is called trichomoniasis. Um, more common, it's called vaginitis. It can also be call, called ballantitis, which is the infection of the penis. Um, but here's the symptomology of it. And so this is called strawberry cervix. And all of the little lesions are where the axle style has attached, how this, where this infectious agent has attached to the cervix itself. Okay. So remember, I'll, I'll probably give you a hint on the practical. I'll say this looks like a, a mouse click, click, right? Uh, and so if you think about that, then you're looking at an oval shaped structure that has a single nucleus, has an axle style, and it's trichomonas. Does not have a cyst state, only a trophozoetic state. Okay? Any questions? Anybody have any questions? The second organism in this group is called Giardia lamblia. Giardia lamblia is an enteric parasite. So if you look at it here, you can see all this debris. Can you see all this debris in the background? All this debris in the background, all this debris. If you see debris in the background like that, that means it's a fecal smear. And if you see that, you can say it's dysentery, right? As a matter of fact, uh, if you are lost, if you're not sure what it causes, guess dysentery, because most of the parasites are going to cause a form of dysentery, at least the protozoal ones, okay? The cyst is being pointed to by a red arrow. And so you can see it's oval in shape, and it has, at least I can count, four nuclei, right? So if you look at this, you can count the four nuclei with me, right? There's one right there, there's two, there's three, and there's four, right? When this gets into the stomach, the stomach weakens it, it breaks apart in the small intestines, it breaks apart and it becomes trophozoitic. Each of those four nuclei are gonna become a trophozoite and the trophozoite is being pointed at by the purple arrows, right? To me, this trophozoite looks like a kite. That's what it reminds me of. Some people might say it looks like a flounder, right? It has these two structures that look like this. Those are not eyes, those are sucking disc. And then it has flagella, which are not stained, so you can't really see them, but it has multiple flagella like this, right? I picked this organism up when we first moved into our house. I found a well in the backyard. I opened the well, I pulled out water from the well, I tested it for bacteria, didn't find any dangerous bacteria, I drank it and I got Giardia because I wasn't looking for the protozoal parasites that potentially could infect me. It causes uh, a mild form of dysentery, but the feces is very malodorous, smells terrible. Okay, questions? So if I, was, if I was to ask you on a practical, please describe the cyst 
of Jardia, what would you tell me? What would you tell me? If I ask you to describe the cyst of Jardia, oval with four nuclei, I like it. What if I said, describe the trophozoite of Jardia? What would you say? What would you say? Looks like a kite. Anything else? Okay, those aren't nuclei. They're sucking discs. They have two sucking discs. Very good. Very good. I have a question for you now. So, if you have a dog and it's a puppy, how might you get Jardia in your body from your puppy? Maybe them eating their poop and licking your face? Yeah, that, that's exactly the way, Amy. They eat their, or not, maybe not their poop, but some other animal's poop, and they get Jardia, and then they come in and they lick you in the mouth, and you get a little bit of the cyst in your in your mouth and you swallow it and then you get Jardia. Very good, Miss. You know what? Amy made me happy today. Everybody gets one point today. Wow, that's two points already. I better slow down on that, All right? Yeah. Um, for Michaela, for Jardia, yes. Other organisms will have more, okay? All right. Let's go on to the next one. So now we're gonna go to the euglenozoa. And so the two organisms that I selected here are gonna be hemoflagellates. That means they're gonna be in blood. Can everybody appreciate that when you're looking at the slide, when you're looking at the image, that there's blood in the image. Can you see that? Right? Okay, so if you see blood, it, it's, it's gonna be maybe this one, right? Because there's not very many that are gonna be in blood. Most of them are gonna be in feces. But this one, um, there are two different uh, species, Trypanosoma brucei or gambians that causes African sleeping sickness. And the vector for that is a setsi fly. And then Trypanosoma cruci, which causes Chagas disease. And the vector for that is the kissing bug, the regivia bug or the triatome bug. And you're only gonna be responsible for the, for the trophozoite. I'm not gonna get into the other stages because it gets very complicated. So you're only gonna be responsible for the trophozoite. The trophozoite, it's gonna be in blood, but it's going to be on the outside of the blood cells, not on the inside. And if you were to pull this and straighten it out, it would be the size of three erythrocytes. And that's probably what I will tell you on the practical. This is the size of three erythrocytes, okay? So immediately you should think, oh my God, that's a trypanosome. And then the other way that I'm gonna differentiate it is I'm gonna say this organism was recovered from somebody uh, who lived in uh, the Ivory Coast. And if I said that, what, what genus and species is it going to be? Okay, I'm assuming everybody knows that the Ivory Coast is in Africa. Yes? So what genus and species? Okay. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. Go. Okay. 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 So my bad. What country do you know that's in Africa? I'll use that one. That's right, Sarah. How about the Congo? What if I said the Congo? Would be okay. South Africa. No, it's gonna be more West West Africa. Let's just say the Congo. Everybody know down. Put down the Congo. Okay. Very good. All right. What if I said, what if I said um, this organism was isolated from a patient in Arizona? Now what would you say? Trypanosoma cruzi. Very good. Good. So African sleeping sickness causes, it's a, it gets into the blood, but it causes a neurological disease, which basically shuts down the nervous system. And people become unconscious and then pass away. That's why it's called African sleeping sickness. Trypanosoma cruzi um, gets into the blood and then it causes 
cardiomyopathy attacks a heart or it causes intestinal problems, right? Okay. I will only show you the trophozoite and it will be in blood. And I will say something like this. This is the length of three erythrocytes. Okay. Any questions? I have one. Okay. What's so up? For, so for both of these, because it's like two species, so they're both mm -hmm. going to be in blood and they're both going to be the size of three erythrocytes, right? Correct. There are ways, I mean, that, are, that you can tell them apart morphologically. Mm -hmm. It's it's beyond the scope of this course. I'm not going to okay. get into it, right? So the only, the other way that you can do this is to say where they were found, like they were recovered in the Congo or they recovered in, you know. Okay, um, so that's how we're going to okay. be able to know which one you're That's asking. the way I'm going to do it. That okay. way it makes it easy and you don't have to look at any of the other parts of the of the parasite. All right, okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Next, we're going to go to the amoebozoa. And this is into amoeba histolytica. It's going to have just to make it to make it so that everybody can see, it's going to have at least four nuclei. But there are probably going to be more, right? And so if you think about this, uh, for histolytica, you, one, two, I can count six here. It can go up sometimes up to 14, okay? The cyst is being shown uh, by the red arrows. They're perfectly round and they have several nuclei in them, but there's gonna be at least four, okay? That you'll be able to see. And then the trophozoite is being represented by the purple arrows and it is amorphous, right? What does that mean when I say amorphous? No real shape. It doesn't have any real shape, right? So this one, if you will, this one kind of looks like a pear. This one looks like a potato and this one looks like a boot, right? And so they don't have any real distinct shapes, right? So the clue, if you hear amorphous, it's gonna be an amoeba, okay? And now, if you look at the background, look at the background here and the background, the background, all the background, what does it tell you? What does the background tell you? That it's in poop. Very good, Cesar. So what does it cause? What does it cause? Dysentery. Now, this particular organism can go and infect other parts of the body, but just to make it easy, we're just gonna stay with dysentery, okay? Anybody have any questions about into amoeba? Okay, the next one is amoeba proteus. I'm, I'm gonna show this to you mostly because it will allow me to, to test your ability to identify the pseudopods, the pseudopoda. And so the pseudopoda are being um, pointed to by the purple arrows, right? So if you see, I'm always gonna show you amoeba proteus and it's gonna look something like this. There's gonna be lots of pseudopoda, right? But mostly I'm gonna be interested in the pseudopoda, okay? It's a commensal, it doesn't cause disease but it shows the structures very well. When, when Almandera took me for um, 1406, we saw some of these amoeba and they were just gorgeous how they were moving around, right? We had one student, that's all they wanted to do this, that whole one hour period during lab. That's all they wanted to do. They just wanted to watch the amoeba because they thought it was fascinating. And the amoeba was feeding, so that made it more fun even then. Okay, questions? Moving on to the next organism. This is Paramecium caudatum. It's also a commensal. It doesn't cause infection, but it's oval in shape and it has all of these very fine um, cilia surrounding the entire structure. Okay, good. Anybody have any questions? It's a classic example of a ciliate, but it's a commensal. The pathogen in this group is Ballantidium coli. Ballantidium coli, the cyst is perfectly round and the troph is oval in shape. But the difference between these guys and everything else is that they have a macronucleus. And the macronucleus to me always looks like a U or it is like a horseshoe. And I will show you uh, that all the time right, or I'll at least mention it. So remember, these are three dimensional organisms and we're looking at them in one plane. So it's easy to see the, the 
macronucleus in the trophozoite, but you can't really see them because they're on a different plane in the in the cyst. The cysts are perfectly round. The trophs are oval in shape. You can actually see the cilia if you look really closely, right? They're a little fuzzy around the edges, but more importantly, it's the macronucleus. Okay, so if you hear the word macronucleus come out of my mouth, then it's going to be Ballantidium coli. Anybody have any questions? What does it cause, Cesar? What infection? Maybe he. Okay, Amy, dysentery. <laughs> Very good. Because of the background, right? All right, three more organisms, and these are the most fun, right? And so they become to the apicomyplexa. The apicomyplexa, the apicomyplexa that's, that's okay. The ap it had that background. It had all that debris in the background, says hot. But the apicomyplexa are the bad boys of the group, and we start with plasmodium. And anytime you see an SPP like this, anytime you see an SPP like this, that means there's several different species, okay? Uh, that's okay, Amy. You can help out your colleague anytime. Okay. And so what type of matrix is it in? What type of matrix is it in? The blood. Mm -hmm. So this is another one that might be in blood, right? Oh, it will be in blood. But the difference here is, is that it is inside the red blood cell. Are you with me? So if I was to draw this for you, I would draw a red blood cell. And on the inside, I would draw the trophozoite. And that's the only thing you're going to be responsible for. The trophozoite is also known as a merozoite. And it's also known as a ring structure. Because if you look at it, it looks like there's a little diamond ring inside of the blood. Can everybody see that? Can everybody see that? So this should be a, an easy get correct on the on the on the practical it's going to be inside blood it looks like a ring structure and plasmodium is the etiology it's a cause and it causes malaria okay anybody have any questions what does the spp thing mean again i i just that means that there's more than one species right so for instance Plasmodium falciparum is one species, but there are six different species that cause malaria, and they all look similar, right? There's Plasmodium ovale, there's Plasmodium malariae, there's Plasmodium bergii. There's a bunch of them, right? So instead of saying, "Hey, you need to know one species," I just said, "Just know, mal just know Plasmodium." Okay, Almendera. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay. All right, two more organisms, and we're done for the day. So the next one is Toxoplasma gondii. Anybody, has anybody ever heard of Toxoplasma gondii? No? Okay. Anybody else? Cesar is learning lots of stuff today. Toxoplasmosis, that's correct, Sarah. That's correct. No, not pink eye. <laughs> Although... It is trending in immunocompromised AIDS patients that it's causing blindness. But this is the one that's associated with cats and birds. And although it can infect every single tissue of the body, it's given a lot of um, credence to potentially causing abortions in pregnant female because the infectious agent can get into the placental area and disrupt the the normal um, process of the developing fetus and cause the fetus to be aborted, right? Uh-huh, yeah. So the, it has both the cyst and the trophozoitic state. The, the cyst is being pointed to by the red arrow. And inside the cyst <coughs> are the bradyozoites, right? Those are the, that's what's in there. And the, so you need to know that cysts contains the bradyzoites. The trophozoites, also known as the tachyzoites, to me, look like 
a crescent moon or a banana or a canoe. Looks like this. But the difference is it has a single nucleus and that nucleus always looks to me like it wants to pop out of the cell, right? <coughs> Excuse me, I didn't, I, I'm trying not to cough, but that's the way it is sometimes, okay? So the common reservoir are cats that we're gonna come in, people also come in contact with birds, but cats are the one. 85% of us, when we got, if we were to get tested against the antibodies for toxoplasma, we would test positive because we have come in contact with it throughout our life. And as long as you have a competent immune system, if you get any kind of infection by, by toxoplasma, it's not gonna mean anything to you. Your body's gonna take care of it and you're not gonna have a problem. But when you don't have an immune system, if you're an AIDS patient or some other, being a pregnant female, you are immunocompromised, right? And therefore you can develop, develop infections by this, right? And it can be quite bad. In the early parts of the um, HIV AIDS epidemic in the early to mid eighties, it was causing infections of a lot of people's brains and uh, and nobody knew how to stop it. And really, it's not stoppable if it gets that far. But you can treat it now with things like metronidazole and it takes care of business for you, okay? So the one thing, oh, okay, yeah. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying <coughs> is if you're pregnant, I'm okay. Well, it depends. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Excuse me one second. Okay. We'll talk about that a little bit later, Amy, but I think I'm leaning to only asking for you all to give me the genus. We'll talk about that on Thursday. Okay. Let me think about it a little bit. Um, but the one thing about this, Amandetta, is if if you're a pregnant female, you don't need you don't necessarily need to get rid of your cat. But what you should do is not empty the litter box because the 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 cysts are released in the cat feces. And so there's another person in the relationship that's not doing much for nine months. They should clean out the litter box. But be sure you tell them uh, that they need to take and scoop up the poo and the urine from the litter box, put it in a in a bag, in a little plastic bag and throw it away as regular trash. Under no condition should you go outside and just dump it out on the lawn because it's it's good fertilizer, right? That's not a good thing because you'll just release the, the cyst into the environment and then that'll cause other organisms to pick it up. Okay, anybody have any questions? Okay, last organism for the day is Cryptosporidium um, parvum. This is also um, in the group Apicomyplexa. And this is the only one that you can uh, learn by color, right? So if you look at the, if you look at the um, pink arrow, it's pointing to the trophozoite. Now that looks a lot like Toxoplasma. So, so that people don't get confused I just decided, you know what, since cryptosporidium is also acid fast and we can test for it, we can screen for it using an acid fast stain, that I am just basically going to say that if you see a hot pink structure that's spherical um, by morphology, that you should say that it's cryptosporidium. Right now, notice all of the debris in the environment. And so what infection does it cause? What infection does it cause? With all that debris, dysentery, hmm, very good. There've been huge outbreaks all over the United States about of cryptosporidium. It causes dysentery. You typically get it from drinking contaminated water, although you can do it by food also. Um, but there's been an outbreak in Cedar Park and there's been outbreaks in San Antonio. So it's around, right? And usually if you've got a competent immune system, even if you get it into your body, it's not gonna really cause you a problem. But when you're immunocompromised, you are an HIV, or I'm sorry, you're an AIDS patient. You, if, you do, if you contract cryptosporidium, you might have it for the rest of your life. 
because there's you just don't have a way to get rid of it. Now we can treat it with um, antiprotozoals, but uh, some people might have to take those prophylactically on a daily basis. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about anything we covered today? <laughs>